Today we're interviewing Tim. Tim is the co-founder and CTO of SendGrid, one of the biggest email service provider around. Originally, I met Tim when dealing with spam issues in QuickMail. He was kind enough to jump on a call with me and share a lot of his knowledge. So when Jack and I decided to invite someone to talk about deliverability, Tim came to mind immediately. In this cast, we go over the challenges that every cold emailer faces from a deliverability standpoint, why engagement is king when it comes to cold email deliverability, and how getting clicks can actually increase your open rate. This is Jeremy from QuickMail.io. And this is Jack from Emails That Sell. Episode 16. Now, I know that uh, cold email is probably not in your alley in terms of uh, well, for SendGrid. Could you tell us like, a little bit about that? And if you, you can also talk about your definition of spam and, and what's your view on spam as well, so we can uh, start on the, on the right foot. Yeah, sure. So cold email is definitely a, a sticky subject. It's... Um... We have, unfortunately, a lot of experience with it here at SendGrid, especially in the early days, just learning lessons the the hard way of it. And there's just a whole host of problems with cold emails, uh, the first of which being that old email addresses get reclaimed by the um, inbox providers as spam traps. And so the the older and colder that your list is, the more likely you are to run into spam trappy type problems. Uh, furthermore, even to the point where entire domains, if a domain goes inactive, uh, a company, a blacklist company will buy that up and turn it into a blacklist. I had a, a perfectly valid customer who they were just trying to send out a notification to all of their customers of, hey, we're going to do some, some maintenance. And they suddenly had their IP blacklisted because some, cu some customer of theirs had gone out of business and wow. the, the domain had been claimed by a blacklist company. And so it's like, okay, the, that, that company was doing absolutely nothing wrong, but because they were sending to what was essentially a cold list, because they didn't normally engage with their customers, they were getting blacklisted. It's, it's just such a, uh, a tricky area and um, <laughs> definitely fraught with things. In, in terms of my, my definition of spam, spam is essentially unwanted mail, right? It's something where, where somebody's sending you a message that you don't want to receive. So, Tim, any conversation around email deliverability uh, probably will have sender reputation come up at some point. So what is sender reputation and why is this so important for deliverability? So sender reputation at the broad level is how somebody determines the, um, really the engagement level of your messages, um, it, it's it's a measure of how wanted is your mail. It's going to vary by the inbox provider, and so that makes it kind of a sticky subject uh, of hey, okay, what is reputation? How do you define it? But it's because it's it varies based on who is the receiver. Why it's important is because whoever the receiver is is the one who makes the ultimate decision of how they're going to classify your mail. Will they? deliver it to the inbox? Will they deliver it to the spam folder? Will they tell you that they accepted the message and just outright delete it? Which happens. And so it's, in the end, your reputation is the most important thing uh, long term for a company because it is the, the ultimate metric of how many people you're going to reach. It's not a matter of how big your list is. It's a matter of how many people actually receive that message into the inbox. And how does SendGrid monitor the sender reputation? Is there a one-size-fits-all sort of solution? Uh, there isn't really because the reputation is going to depend on the inbox provider. Um, there are places like eDataSource, which we use, that kind of tell you what the inboxing rate is at the various providers. And so while internally we have kind of our own reputation for our compliance team, uh, really someplace like eDataSource that provides the uh, the across-the-board values is very, very useful so that you can see, hey, you're having a problem at Yahoo, but not at Hotmail, that type of thing. And since it's so important, 
Uh, I'm sure a lot of SendGrid users or anyone sending emails would like to improve it. Do you have any tips for boosting sender reputation? The main thing is sending to engaged users. Uh, that That's the thing that the inbox providers want the most, right? They want to see that people are opening your messages. They want to see that, they're, that people are clicking on the links. They want to see activity from their end users, and that tells them that, hey, yeah, the this individual is someone who we want. And so our advice to customers is very often, hey, trim down your list, which is very counterintuitive since we bill based on how many people uh, someone sends to, but it's in the end, we want our customers to do what's best for their business and, and make it grow. And so it's about uh, quality over quantity. So I'm wondering, you know, we've talked about a couple of things, but today, what are some of the major challenges around getting your emails delivered in general? Uh, a lot of the challenges are about just jumping through all of the right hoops and getting your email classified properly. Um, and, and furthermore, even just knowing what's going on with it, right? That's probably the the biggest hurdle for, for most senders is you send out a message and it's like, okay, what happened with it? You, you can try and monitor your engagement rate, but that doesn't even really tell you the full extent. And so it's, it's really understanding what is happening so that you can try and correct it. There's not a, a one size fits all on that. So I'm wondering about email content and how that may or may not impact deliverability. Have you ever seen a message or a campaign that had deliverability issues because of the content alone? Yeah, what you'll find is websites will get onto blacklists. And so you could have where like links that are in your message that are perfectly valid uh, just because of where they've gone, got added to a blacklist, uh, causes the uh, the message to be sent to the spam folder. Um, the The spam filtering stuff has gotten fairly sophisticated. It's not like it's, oh, I see the word Viagra, and so I'm immediately going to throw it into the spam folder. They do a lot of heuristics. They do a lot of uh, very intelligent machine learning. And so while you could still craft a message that just purely on content is going to end up in the spam folder, it's very unlikely. Do you got any uh, specific experience to um, dealing with blacklists um, from a SendGrid uh, standpoint? Oh, yeah. We have lots and lots <laughs> and lots of experience dealing with blacklists. Uh, I think I do remember a funny story you told me about um, them trying to blacklist you or, or blackmail you and then you blacklisting them or something like that? Yeah, I'm not going to name any names, but there's a, uh, a blacklist out there that essentially lists you for lists you on their, their blacklist and is like, yeah, pay us money or let it expire after a year. And uh, yeah, we did some stuff to identify who they were and just said, you know, fine, we're just not going to deliver to your blacklist. In general, we don't like to do that kind of stuff because trying to get around the blacklist companies um, isn't necessarily the right approach. It's trying to say it's more like how we work with SpamHoss, where when there's a problem, they let us know and we say, oh, okay, yeah, you're seeing problems. We're going to go and take action against that customer. So I don't want to give the impression that we're like, hey, yeah, we're just going to go and blacklist all blacklist companies. But uh, <laughs> there, there are certain ones that it's just kind of like, really, this is BS. And <laughs> we're going to do what we can at that point to defend our customers. So, Tim, I've, I've heard a lot of advice about warming up a new IP, but I'd love to hear your take on it. Um, specifically, do I need to bother with warming up an inbox or an IP address if if I don't send more than a thousand emails a day, and if so, what's the right way I should be warming up an IP address that's brand new? Yeah, I, I think a thousand emails a day, and there's really not. Uh, that's practically doing a warm up, right? It's you, you million emails to a million emails a day. <laughs> if you didn't start it somewhere well, uh, well above a thousand. Uh, so for very, very low volume senders, that kind of a thing isn't necessarily a big deal. But as soon as you start really ramping up into volume then doing a slow a slow roll up is important and the reason why it's important is uh, like i was saying the inbox providers look at engagement rates in order to determine hey am i going to send this here or send that there and 
so you want to give them time to kind of build up that that reputation. If you send them a million emails day one, they're going to be like, well, gee, I don't have any reputation on this, so I'm going to be conservative. If it's a very small number, they're like, okay, it's not so damaging, and they're going to let it through and say, okay, now we're going to look at the engagement and build a reputation from there. So just curious, Tim, we've spoke about how important engagement is uh, in terms of deliverability. What's one way that if I'm sending a transactional email with, let's say, an invoice, I can get my subscribers to actually engage with it in a meaningful way that will help improve my deliverability? Oh boy, that's going to depend on the uh, the circumstance, right? It's like in general, I certainly read invoice receipts of, hey, what's going on with it? Um, if it's something that's being shipped, certainly making sure that there's tracking information. Uh, if, if you make sure that the, the content of the email is more than just what they were already presented at the website, that will, will help make sure that people are, are going to actively engage with that message. Yeah, so it seems that there is a bit more um, intelligence that is to go when you're crafting an email and just you know choosing your deliverability service and, and just going with it. Yeah, it's it's stuff like making sure that the subject is the kind of thing that people are going to click on, A-B testing not just your, your marketing emails, but A-B testing your invoice messages, right? It's it's all about making sure that, that your content is stuff that people want and that they want to engage with. If I, let's say, miss the boat and it turns out that my email deliverability is not where I want it to be, What's the first thing you would recommend doing to improve deliverability for, for maybe a Sangri customer or somebody, another business sending emails? I was just going to say, my, my first recommendation would be to sign up for SendGrid and uh, ask for deliverability <laughs> consulting services, <laughs> which we would be happy to provide. Check. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> that, that really is the, as much as that's the, the cop-out answer, it really is about looking at you, you need someone who has that kind of experience such as our deliverability consultants for uh to, to just understand why right it's th there's a whole bunch of the factors of what's going on with deliverability it's not like there could be just one thing and so really step one is getting a hold of somebody who knows what they're doing to be able to help you figure it out and um, i was thinking as well they, there's um, a lot of um non-understanding of really what happens when people click, you know, it's a spam email kind of thing. Do you have any insight on that? Like in Gmail, when we, we flag it as spam or things like that? Yeah, for most inbox providers, at least all, all of the top ones, what will happen is they'll generate some kind of a uh, complaint feedback loop message, ideally. Um, Gmail does kind of an anonym anonymization of things, uh, but others will actually provide you the email address of who did it. And so from, from, from a sender standpoint, you can generally find out uh, who is marking it spam, or if not with Gmail, at least the number of people who are marking it as spam. In terms of the, the inbox provider, right, that's a serious ding to reputation because it's uh, it versus their, uh, their machine learning saying, hey, I think that this is unwanted mail. That's a human being saying, hey, I, I really don't want that. That being said, interesting uh, side note on that is there are places where people use mark as spam as the delete because it gets it out of their inbox. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so we actually saw a huge problem with that with um, an entire country where that was the kind of behavior that people would uh, would exhibit. So for small businesses that are sending email, how should they be monitoring their deliverability? Yeah, it gets real tough for a, for a small company. Um, something like eData Source is really an excellent option. Um, it gets expensive, and that's that's always the problem that small companies run into is that the uh, when you try and do it yourself, there's a lot of just there's expense stuff, and there's just lack of contacts to to be able to do it. It's like let's say that you used eData Source, and it tells you that hey, you're having problems at Gmail. Okay, you know that there's a problem. Now what? Now you have to still find someone. You're not going to find someone at Gmail to talk to. And so now you've got to find someone who can find someone to talk to or deliverability service type stuff. It's it's getting to the point. I mean, <clears throat> it's a, a big reason why SendGrid exists and other uh, 
email delivery services is it's a a very tough problem to to go about on your own it's the the world has changed so much that um, it's it's not really recommended to go just hey yeah I'm a small company I'm going to do it myself it's very affordable to outsource that to to someone like SendGrid who has all of those resources to be able to make you successful do you think keeping tabs on your open rates is going to give you somewhat of a pulse on how you're doing deliverability wise definitely it's by far the the best metric for you as a receiver outside of something like uh, eData Source to be able to to tell you how how things are going. Where where do you think Tim is the uh, the future of uh, of email going? Do, do, I mean, in nine years, you see a lot of things changing in in habits and and how it evolved. What do you think is the next sort of like big thing or or um, big uh, disruption that may happen to uh, to email in general and deliverability? I think one of the biggest things that's going to happen to email, at some point we're going to have to get off of IP-based reputation. Uh, Gmail is kind of heading that way. IPv6 is just not catching on as as well as people hoped. My my joke is that my professor talked about uh, IPv6 when I was in college 20 years ago and said, hey, it's a thing. Everyone's got to switch to it in the the very near future, and and here we are, right? I I don't know which is going to happen first, maybe retired or IPv6 come out. But uh, it's a close rate <laughs> race, and so just moving away from IP reputation and moving more towards uh, domain reputation, uh, there's going to be a lot more machine learning stuff that's going to happen. Uh, ideally, there's going to be a lot more just data sharing that happens. It's like you look at uh, SendGrid and even some uh, a large number of our competitors. We still collaborate on. Uh, making sure that bad actors don't go and just abuse one system, move on to the next and abuse that one, move on to the next system. Mm. Um, it's it's really about uh, building the ecosystem versus just having it be people going it alone. Do you actually share data between some of the big provider, you know, maybe anonymized or anything just to prevent that from happening at the moment? Uh, we'll, we'll share it with, our, like I said, with our competitors, and we won't even necessarily anonymize the the stuff. It's like, hey, we see people signing up with this type of stuff. These are the IP ranges. Um, this is the type of email that they send. Uh, no one wants to enable fishers to be able to uh, take advantage of recipients. You know, that's just bad for everybody. Very much so, we try and collaborate and say, hey, how do we make sure that the people who are just abusing systems don't abuse everybody? Well, Tim, we really appreciate you taking some time out to join us on the podcast today. Uh, Thanks so much for sharing all your insights. Thank you for having me. Okay, so three things we learned on today's cast. Number one, engagement is the ultimate metric that's going to determine your deliverability rate. Number two, spam lists will buy old domains. So make sure that your list is up to date to avoid getting blacklisted. And finally, there's a few resources online that's going to help you identify where your deliverability issues are, but by far the most affordable tool that we have to stay on top of our deliverability is your open rate tracking. So use that to make sure that you're inboxing properly.